welcome to Money Matters TV. My name is Patty Tawadros. I'm your host today. I own Studio X, a digital marketing firm, and my co-host is Ken Jordan. He is with Roundpoint Mortgage. Hey, Ken, how are you doing? I'm wonderful, Patty. How are you? Good. Do you do commercial or residential mortgages? We do primary. We'll do 100% residential financing. Um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, FHA. We do some multi-unit stuff under four units. Uh, but as far as commercial financing, uh, you know, we leave that to other companies. Yeah. So I got to tell you, our guest later today is Shelly O'Donovan, and she is all about body language. So we're going to learn all the secrets about reading when people are lying to us. Probably how to sit, how much to fidget, how much not to I'm gonna be fidget. very self-conscious the whole time. Like I don't know how to. I am too. <laughs> we need a filter in Zoom that's like anti-lie. <laughs> so what I'm really curious about is if we could talk about the whole housing market and vaccines and corporations, because I think they're all very tied together. So I kind of see this trend where companies are requiring vaccines. We have clients that are requiring employees to disclose their vaccine status because they have federal contracts. Or I know Southwest Airlines came down with requirements that put them in a bit of a mess recently with people showing up. Are there things that you notice with that? Well, I can I can speak from experience that, you know, our company is, is, is in a similar boat. I think that, you know, the bottom line is that the government has ways uh, to compel companies to, to do certain things. And, and one of the things that, uh, you know, they're looking for right now is to ensure a safe workplace. And a lot of people feel that the vaccine is the way to go uh, to ensure that the workplace is safe. Um, I think that some synergy is lost when we're not together in the office. There's no doubt. Um, so, you know, requiring vaccines or requiring a negative test is really the only way a lot of folks feel you can create uh, the environment where people can work together person to person. Mm -hmm. I. What about people quitting their jobs. You see that exodus happening as soon as like mandate dates hit, then people start quitting and looking for a different opportunity. Well, I haven't seen that yet. Um, you know, I'm in a position where people, if they quit their job when they're dealing with me, that could oh, really throw yeah. a monkey yeah. in the yeah. <laughs> So I have a feeling that um, that I I may not run into that that problem very often. Um, but if it's going to happen, it's going to happen soon because you're right. The mandates are coming down and the companies are finally putting in place their policies and their practices to address those mandates. And uh, and and you're right. We might find that, you know, right before closing, someone says, look, I didn't get my vaccine. I don't intend to get a vaccine and therefore I'm no longer employed. That could be a problem if you're looking to get a mortgage. There's no doubt. Yeah, that happens. I think there's a bunch of healthcare institutions where nurses or doctors or people that work there chose not to get vaccinated and left their jobs. It was pretty surprising. So that takes us to that next section where, you know, my office used to be in downtown Philadelphia, mm -hmm. the pandemic hit, we decided to go fully virtual. And my team is dispersed all over the US. And I, I see that trend happening. What do you see from people buying houses in cities versus the suburbs now? When it started, it was kind of a a little bit of a trend, but it ha I mean, it's really um, become commonplace. And that is that we're looking at the metro areas uh, are, or people are starting to branch out further and further from those metro areas. And the huge opportunity as a homeowner, if you're allowed to work from home, you know, go ongoing, is that you can afford to buy maybe a bigger house, maybe a little more land um, for less money because you're further and further from you know, the center of the, you know, the, 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 the city where, or maybe you worked before we've seen uh, one of our uh, loan officers uh, does a lot of business in the Poconos and we've seen an explosion of home ownership in the Poconos uh, from folks that are essentially purchasing homes from New York because they don't have to commute to, to the office every day or their every third day. Look at the resort towns. If you look at, you know, New Jersey and the South Jersey shore, you're starting to see an explosion in home ownership and appreciation rates along with it 
because if you can work from home, why not work from the beach, you know, and, and we're starting to see people, you know, taking advantage, whether they owned the home before and they're just down there, you know, it was their second home or they rented it out. They're not renting it out anymore or they're flat out buying there. It started, I think, because people were we were kind of weary of travel. And if you're looking to get away, you need a place to kind of get away without having to get on an airplane. I think that's starting to subside a little bit. But I think that the work from home reality is here to stay. And I think that it's going to impact, you know, your second home markets, as well as those little maybe there's a little bit more rural areas um, where where you get a little more for your money. You know, the struggle that I have and I'm sure I'm not alone. Are you guys remote? Your team? You are. So this is this is my home office where I've been since, you know, well, not this is this. I redid my office since I'm here every day. But uh, <laughs> this is since the pandemic started. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So here's my thing. How do companies maintain corporate culture? You know, when you are onboarding people that were never in person with you, they were never sitting 10 feet away from you and you got lunch with them on a regular basis. It's really different. How do you guys do it in your company? It's very different, but we've onboarded two operations uh, staff and three loan officers since the pandemic started. And you just utilize the technology as best you can. You know, we have we have Zoom and we have Microsoft Teams, which allows us to net, virtually sit next to each other. One of the things that we do is we set up essentially hangouts where a new loan officer can be hooked up to a Zoom all day long. And if they have a question, they wave their hand and you, you, know, you unmute yourself, you answer the question. If they want to listen in and shadow, one of the big values in my business of working together with, with originators is that, you know, you kind of learn from each other. Uh, and hopefully um, our guest will give us some, some insight here too, because how you communicate with your clients is is critical and and we learn how what works and what doesn't work when communicating by listening to each other and uh, and i think that our technology allows us to sit next to each other and listen in on conversations listen to you know how things are presented when we're not actually uh face to face the lunch piece i miss that dramatically i mean going to lunch was a, a big part of the day and, and it's a great morale booster and a bonding experience so so that's hasn't quite been uh been the same. But I think from a training standpoint, we've been able to, to, to bridge the gap by and large with the technology that's available. Okay. I think this takes us really nicely into this question, which I know everyone's interested in. So this question comes from Richard Whitley in Philadelphia, and he asks, how will the housing market change if mortgage rates increase? Whew. So my addendum is, are they going to increase? <laughs> Hold on. Let me get my crystal ball. Um, <laughs> We don't know. They, they've they've ticked up a little bit over the last couple of weeks. I know it's tough, not depending on when you're watching this show, to to understand the context. But um, but an interest rate increase, um, what that is going to do, among other things, is from a mortgage company standpoint, it's going to decrease the number of um, refinances uh, that are that are being closed on a monthly basis, and that's going to decrease the revenue line for a lot of lenders, especially lenders that are tied primarily to refinance business. Um, the overhead's not going anywhere, but the revenue is going to drop. And that kind of creates what they call, um, you know, uh, kind of margin compression is the term um, where interest rates uh, may be the increase in interest rates might be exasperated in some channels because they still have those expenses. Um, but as far as the real estate market goes, if you increase interest rates, effectively what you're doing is decreasing affordability. For the, for the standard homeowner. And if you're decreasing affordability, what you're also doing is decreasing the population of people that can afford that home. And if interest rates increase enough, then you might actually start to see less and less demand on the seller's side. Now, the good news is right now, the sellers have so much leverage that you know the buyers that are getting their offer accepted are the ones putting a lot of money down, the ones with the highest credit. You know, First time buyers, 3% down, 3.5% down. These buyers are really struggling not only because there's multiple offers, but because of appraisal gaps and things of that nature, we might actually see a decrease in, in demand open up opportunity for borrowers who are currently not in the market. So I don't think that an increase in interest rates is gonna necessarily um, hurt the real estate market. What it's going to, to hopefully do is, is, is maybe bring it more into equilibrium and more balance, because right now the sellers have just about all the leverage in the in the marketplace so one last question before we wrap up this segment is i'm so curious 
what happens when somebody goes 50 or $100,000 over asking? They're literally coughing up that money because their house isn't going to appraise for that, right? It may or may not. I've been surprised on both sides of that coin. So um, the, we call it the appraisal gap. And if you're, you know, if you're buying a house and it's, uh, you know, a four, let's say it's a four hundred thousand dollar house and you're you're borrowing three hundred thousand, you have one hundred thousand essentially in down payment. If the house appraises for three fifty. Well, I mean, you're still buying the house for four hundred. You're still borrowing three hundred thousand. What changes is what we call the loan to value ratio. Mm-hmm. So instead of being, you know, a uh, 75% loan to value ratio, it's up, it's above 80. So you may have these situations where it's not that big of a deal if the appraisal comes in low because the down payment's not going to change. Where it is a problem is in max financing situations. If you have someone that's only putting 5% down and the appraisal comes in low, well, now you have to do something. You either have to lower the sale price to match the appraisal or you have to make the buyer has to make up that difference in cash. So it really, the, 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 the magnitude of you know how much that impacts the transaction has everything to do with the type of financing that that person's getting and, and how much they were putting down to begin with. But it is happening. Appraisals are coming in higher than expected in some cases, but people um, are able to still buy even though the appraisal came in well below what the asking price was. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that some of you have questions that you would love to get answered. Here's how you send in your questions to Money Matters. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, send us your questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, T-V dot com. Okay, welcome back. I am super excited. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Shelly before she joins us. She teaches persuasive speaking at Wharton, and she has led vaccine advocacy for GSK, worked as a healthcare lobbyist, and served as a staffer in state government. So she has a really diverse background, and I'm really excited to learn how to get away with telling little lies to my husband. (laughs) Excellent, excellent. I can give you lots of tricks and tips on that one. (laughs) Thanks, Shelly. So tell us what got you into this kind of work. You have, I mean, a really diverse background. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I started in politics and just started to notice these patterns of how people influence, translated that into a lobbying role at the University of Pennsylvania Health System. So learned to kind of influence on behalf of my employer for patients and also for the health system itself, moved on to GSK, had similar positions there, right? Really zoning on on the messaging and trying to influence. But all along, I noticed there were these patterns and that we could take those patterns and really use those patterns for ourselves. So I started to dig deep into learning body language and I was asked to go to Harrisburg as kind of a lobbying uh, junk at a lobbying hill day with the life science industry, went up for that day. And we were meeting with one legislator in particular, a freshman legislator, and everyone walked in right to meet with him. And these are like these little meetings where you kind of uh, tell a little bit about why you're there, why the issue is important. And then you go to the next person. So you're on a team. And this legislator just had all the body language, right? He sat up tall He looked at people right in the eye when he was talking to them and he just opened up the room. And all of a sudden I saw other people like sitting up more in the meeting, like engaging more. And people walked out of that room with like, you know, a little bit of a step in their walk and just excited. And this was a a freshman legislator. So that means he's got like no power in the uh, legislature at that time. And so it was just incredible to see it really in action and to realize that it was the body language and just how he was commanding the room. And that's when I I decided to just open business, teach others these tricks and tips. Patty, it's interesting uh, when when Shelly had mentioned sitting up straight, I think both of us did. <laughs> How important, how important that is uh, to you know to your 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 presence. Um, now, in, we're in the financial services industry. The majority of our audience is in the financial services industry. So, Shelly, what what is the most important thing 
Uh, would you say when it comes to uh, our clients, we're working with our clients when it, in the financial services industry? Yeah. So for you, because you're in this client relationship, the biggest thing is to build trust. And so there are a number of things that you can do in order to build that trust. So first of all, seeing the client right, and knowing that you trust the client, that's going to come through in your kind of in your engagement with them. But from a body language perspective, the thing that we mo notice first when we meet someone is actually their hands. And so if I don't see, if we have a you know, meeting and I don't see your hands while we're talking um, and you just put them on your lap and they're on your lap during the whole time, I'm actually going to feel subconsciously like, oh, there's something about Ken I don't quite trust. And I may not know what it is unless I know body language, but I'm going to feel that way. And that comes back to kind of when we were cavemen, right? And we're walking down the dirt path and I, you know, I see Patty and the first thing I'm looking for are her hands because I want to know if she has a weapon. And so our brains still look for that subconsciously because we're trying to figure out like, is Patty a friend or a foe? And so if I don't see those hands, um, I may feel a little uneasy about trusting her. So Ken, when you talk to clients, keep your hands above the camera. And <laughs> <laughs> well, that's frame is perfect for that. Money yeah. in each hand. <laughs> Does it have to be all the time or every once in a while? Just No. Yeah. yeah. Every once in a while. And very natural. And I tell folks that don't typically talk with their hands. Like, don't just go into a high stakes meeting and start talking with your hands. It will not look natural. Like you need to practice it in kind of some low stakes places. Understood. So what do people do um, wrong when they're trying to build trust? Yeah. So a number of things that people do wrong. One thing is they have these blocking behaviors. So that's like crossing your arms or like you might take a piece of paper or a notebook and put it in front of you. Sometimes we do it because we're uncomfortable. And so it's, you know, could even be like a, a temperature thing that you're cold in an office, but that makes it really hard for someone to trust you. And so we want to open up your body language and also open up the body language of, of your client. So if you're in person and you see your client do this, right, this kind of blocking behavior, that might be the point at which you hand them something and you say, hey, uh, do you think you could just write down for me a few things that you want to see in a new house? Um, and that's going to open up them and that's going to get them to open up to kind of the ideas that you're putting forward and get more open discussion between you, more trust built. Shelly, a follow up to that. What do you do when you have client calls and they leave the camera off? That happens to me yes. with certain clients a lot. Yeah. So that is a real problem right now. And I, <clears throat> so there are a couple of things. So first and foremost, if you can get them to turn that camera on, that is going to give you so much more information mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, their body language, if they're receptive to what you're saying. If you can't get them to turn it on, you can also still get some clues from their voice tone. So, um, you know, we tend to actually trust people a little more when their voice tone is lower. And so I tell people to kind of play with their own register of voice. You don't want to go so far out of your typical register that it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But a lower voice tone, people that have lower voice tones are seen as more trustworthy. And so, and you know yourself, like if you're on a meeting and someone is not on screen, <clears throat> you can hear it in their voice when they're like, you know, looking at their screen and doing something else when they're not paying attention. Should you leave your camera on? It's like two people, you and the client, theirs is off. Do you keep <clears throat> yours on? So I personally do because I think it's really important for them to see me as well. But I would also warn them. I just had a call this morning with someone and I said, to, he said, oh, I didn't realize this was going to be a video call. And I was, and I said to him, well, um, you know, if you can turn your camera on, that's great. If not, it's fine. He didn't turn his camera on, but I turned, I left my camera on and I just said to him, do you mind if I leave mine on? Because at least he's seeing me. And mm -hmm. so the other thing that gets built is, um, the kind of connection between you. So even if uh, you don't see them, they see you and they can build some oxytocin with kind of looking at you, looking in your eyes. And it's this hormone that we build of connection. So if we saw each other in person, there'd probably be more oxytocin, built, but even just looking at someone builds that connection hormone. I heard once that the, the sweetest sound anyone can ever hear is their own name. 
And, you know, when you use that as a, as in, in your verbal communication, that tends to build trust as well. What are others, what are some other nonverbal and verbal uh, things we can do to increase our client engagement and, and ultimately their, their satisfaction? Yeah, absolutely. So there's lots of stuff you can do. So again, having that open body language, showing your hands. The other thing is first impressions are really, really important. And so um, Bernieri did a study in which he looked at first impressions and he kind of took folks that were going in for interviews and he filmed them interviewing. And then he had participants look at those recordings and they looked at 20 second clips and 20 minute clips. And they were exactly the same when he asked, you know, who would you hire out of these, these clips? And so it shows us that the first impression happens within 20 seconds of someone meeting you. And that, that goes for online. It goes for a voicemail as well. So if I leave a voicemail on Patty's um, phone and that's the first time she hears from me, she is going to have some kind of impression set and so it's really important that you take control of that. So some ways to take control of that are like if you're walking into a meeting, you know, not having a million things and kind of struggling with your bag, looking kind of disheveled, just having it together, walking in with confidence, having open body language. In a Zoom meeting, it's the same thing. Like you're on camera. The minute someone sees you, even the minute you speak, if you haven't turned your camera on yet, just really being intentional about that first impression that you're going to put out to clients. Shelly, I got to tell you that we interviewed and hired a bunch of different people, different positions, different level positions, like pretty senior positions and entry level. And the way people show up on camera is truly horrifying. We, I can't tell you how many interviews people were sitting in their bedroom with their unmade bed behind oh. them wearing a band t-shirt, clearly oh, didn't brush their hair that day. And I, what do you recommend to people that are job hunting on Zoom? Yeah, so, so you only have to control this little box, right? It's yeah. not that much space. Like I've had folks that I've had to, you know, take interviews in their basement or whatever, that, like a messy basement. And I say, just hang up like a nice curtain behind you, whatever you can do to control what's behind you. Um, lighting is super important as well. So, you know, getting all the lights in your house and kind of front lighting your face is going to make a huge difference in how you show up in that interview. Um, and then dressing as well. So again, in Zoom, you'll only really need the top half to be dressed professional, but it makes such an important um, impression. And, and the fact that you even remember that right there is a problem, right? That signals that um, an employer has remembered how you showed up to the meeting. And so it's really important that you show up even on Zoom professionally. Now, I have a, a, a kind of a side question, you know, communication over the phone. You don't get the verbal clues or excuse me, you don't get the nonverbal clues that you normally get with you know, your visual clues. But what are some what are some ways you can, you know, um, you can tell that there's some resistance on the other line when you are having a conversation with someone or, you know, you feel this is an important decision for them to make. And, you know, you're what you want to convince them to do what's in their best interest. But they're, you're getting resistance. What are some some clues that you could get to show that they're resistant? Yeah. So you might just get some kind of. Um some pauses or some, even some fillers getting into there, like, uh, I'm not sure Ken or something yeah. like that. Um, those might leak in. And then the other thing is you might just hear that they're distracted as well. So, um, I've worked with clients before who say to me, Oh, like I always walk around when I'm talking to my clients on the phone and you can hear that. So I can hear that you're walking. I can hear that you're not super engaged in our conversation. So that becomes really important. The other thing you might do is to put a picture of that client somewhere, Ken, in front of you when you're talking to them, even if it's just opening up their LinkedIn profile or a picture of them that you see on the web, because that's going to build that oxytocin in your voice and it's going to leak through in your voice and make you connect much stronger with that individual. That's a great tip. That's phenomenal. <laughs> great. Shelly, I used to watch that show on TV called Lie to Me. Did you ever see that? I, I have seen it, yes. <laughs> so the, the concept, Ken, if you hadn't seen it, is they start every episode with like maybe 
they talk about lying and the face you make when you lie. And then they showed clips of politicians, you know, really like popular ones <laughs> and the faces that they made and they matched up and it was so fascinating. And then I've heard other research that says it's not accurate. If somebody's looking to the right, they're not necessarily making it up. So what are the tells that somebody's lying? Yeah, so this is a really super deep topic. Um, and the biggest thing I can tell you is that we all have like a 54% uh, possibility of getting it right, whether somebody is lying or not. And we lie constantly. So, um, and we all lie, little lies, big lies. But the biggest thing is um, context. So once you look at the context that something's in, then you kind of go through a number of cues that are statistically significant lying cues. So some of those things are statistically significant that they talk about in that show, but it's how it's clustered together. And it's also after you get a baseline of someone. So if I was trying to find out, Patty, if you were lying, I might ask you some questions to make you uncomfortable in the beginning, like not things you'd lie about, but just to see what your behavior is. Mm -hmm. And then I would um, have a way of kind of in my brain, uh, piece that out and then asking you some questions I might actually think you're going to lie about. And that's when you see some variation because you might do something and then I'm like, yeah, that's not, that's something new in her, than her normal baseline. And so once I catch that, then there's a fairly good chance. And then you keep asking questions and trying to really figure out, are they really lying or not? So um, never a good thing to come into a conversation assuming somebody's going to lie about it. Yes. <laughs> I always like to trust people. And I don't know why people would lie about big yes. things. I get like little things. But yeah, it's fascinating. It is. And I so one of the things that I love to do um, is because I, you know, kind of cut my teeth in politics and now I teach nonverbals and lie detection. So I love to watch like the the uh, hearings from Washington. And I sit there and I kind of look for the cues and, and I've done some kind of some analysis around some things. And then, you know, a few weeks go by and usually that person, it comes out that they were lying about, about X, Y, or Z. And so it's really fun. Well, I'm going to call you later. I have a lot yeah. of questions about politics. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> awesome. Uh, how about how your body language comes off in comparison to how somebody receives what you're saying. Like if I'm sitting like this and I'm trying to tell someone I'm going to be a great teammate to them, I'm sure they wouldn't really believe that. Exactly. So it's really important to kind of mind what your body is doing and some people just naturally close off. That's kind of part of their personality, but, but you can dial that up and learn to open up a little bit um, more. And that's going to make you come across much more engaged um, much more engaged in that role if you're interviewing and uh, and much more engaged with that company in particular. So good communication is not necessarily inherent talent. It can be learned. You can be you can you can be taught to be a good communicator. Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, you should be trying to ramp up your communication your entire life. So there's no one on this planet that is 100 percent effective communicator all of the time. Um, Kelly, so it's I a work in progress. I hate to do this, but I realize we're just about out of time. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm really looking forward to learning more in the future. I want to let you guys go know next week our guest is Stephanie Latner. She's the CEO of We Vibin Inc. And I got to tell you, I looked it up and I'm really fascinated. Her business helps you improve attention and focus and decrease impulsivity which I read as Amazon late night impulse purchases. So I'm definitely tuning in and I hope you will too. Thank you.